Today we're doing a taste of spring. As you can tell, we're getting some nice sunny weather outside, some warm weather, so our bodies are starting to crave fresh ingredients, and it's the perfect time of year for it. So I always like to start off with showing um, our mise en place off, and that just means to have things in order. So I've got all of our ingredients mise en place off for the cooking class today. This is our um, truffle section, our orange marmalade. Then we go into our niçoise salad, and then our classic ratatouille. The niçoise has a little bit of twist, just because normally it comes with uh, hair couverts or green beans, but in Northern Michigan, we get asparagus first, where in France, they get asparagus a little bit ahead of us. The cool thing about asparagus in France is it actually grows underground, where our asparagus in Northern Michigan is above ground and it comes up like a pencil. Theirs is a little bit underground. It's nice and tender, very similar profile, but it's typically white over in France. We have a variety of white, purples, and greens. We're gonna highlight some green asparagus, but I'm just gonna go ahead and get started. I'm gonna place the um, camera down. I've already started my eggplant in the degorgement, and that's just a really important step. And that just pulls the excess moisture out of an eggplant. Out of, if you folks have ever cooked eggplant at home, if you start sauteing it, it'll uh, seep out an excessive amount of moisture. To help limit the amount of moisture that comes out, we cover it in a little bit of salt and that pulls the moisture out. It works really well if you make eggplant parmesan, eggplant parmesan roll-ups. Pretty much any time you cook with eggplant, putting a little bit of salt, letting it sit for 20 to 30 minutes, pulls that excess moisture out. So when we go to cook it, it just doesn't turn to straight mush. Now that's the polar opposite with mushrooms. When we cook mushrooms at home or in a restaurant, we never season the mushrooms until they're almost done or we're getting ready to serve them. That's because mushrooms have a high moisture content. And if you salt, try to degorge those mushrooms, you're gonna pull all that moisture out and be left with a pile of mush, which you definitely do not want. The texture is nice with food. So I'm just gonna go ahead and get rolling guys. So I've already had my eggplant um, salted for about 30 minutes now. So I'm gonna start beginning and saute my vegetables here, get my pan warm. I have a nice bell pepper, the white onion, Couple zucchini and summer squashes here, all found from Oriana East or West location. Now you'll hear people talk about male and female peppers. It's not true. Um, peppers are going to have three to four bottoms. Their bitterness, their sweetness is all depending on their ripeness. So I try to find a little bit of underripe bell peppers for this recipe just because I like that little bit of bitterness to come through. So I'm going to go ahead and slice that. And always before we slice anything, I like to talk about honing our knives. So we have a honer, we have our knife. You can use a um, German knives, you can use GFS kitchen knives. And before we get into honing, I always like to talk about properly holding a kitchen knife. This is really important just so you don't develop arthritis in your lifetime. It's always nice to pinch the blade with your two fingers, your pointer and your thumb. Let the handle rest, wrap your fingers, and you have a nice grip. That way when you're cutting and slicing, it doesn't put a lot of impact on your wrist and less impact on your wrist is gonna help your wrist not develop that carpal tunnel, which you definitely don't want. So just for honing, you're gonna follow the different angles on the blade. Um, I'm a right-handed, so the angle towards the fruit or vegetables that I'm gonna be cutting is gonna be at a 10%. The inside will be a 30%. So all I wanna do when I'm doing that, 10% is about the size of a penny. Just follow that angle on the blade and do the entire time. So I start from the base and go all the way to the tip. I do eight on the, the right side, eight on the left side. You actually don't press that hard then, do you? I let, nope, you just let the knife glide. You're t um, essentially the way knives are made, there are multiple layers of metal and they come together to form the tip. So this, my fingertips would be the tip of the knife. My palms are the base. Multiple layers of metal come together to form that tip. And as we use that knife, the layers of metal on the blade start to come apart. So all the honing does is putting those layers of metal back together. So we have a nice sharp point. Now, now if you hone every time before you use your knife, you won't have to sharpen it, but every six months or so. And that's just really important because if you buy expensive knives or quality knives, you don't want to take away the metal and end up with a shorter knife, a 
a thinner blade knife, you end up essentially taking the metal away from it and your knife depreciates. So I'm gonna go ahead and start cutting up with my peppers here. And after I take my first slice open, my first slice off, I'm able to see the interior of the pepper. And this is what we call a roll cut in the kitchen. So all I'm gonna do is going nice side by side action, slice, but I'm following the inside of the pepper on the membrane here. And I'm just rolling it with my left hand, back and forth with my right hand. So that I'm left with the nice inside of the pepper. And then of course I trim off the ends, get the bottom of the pepper. And I'll even go as far as taking the top of the pepper off as well. It's important we utilize as much of the vegetables, proteins, anything that we're using. We don't want to waste a lot. Unless you have a compost pile or piggies at home, this is something that's absolutely wonderful to feed your piggies. So from this point, because I said I wanted a little bit of bitterness, I'm not going to cut off the pith or the, um, the interior of this pepper. I'm going to leave this white actually in because I want that bitter flavor to off this, the, offset the flavors of, my, flavors of my ratatouille. And I'm going to cut these into about a medium dice. And that's just because we're going to cook this for about 45 minutes. So if I cut this down to a small dice, it's going to um, disintegrate down in the pan and we're going to be left with a nice pasta sauce. Wouldn't be bad, but it's not entirely what we're trying to cook. Also, when you're cutting peppers and vegetables of the sorts, the skin is a little bit resilient. So instead of trying to slice through the skin, if you flip your pepper over and cut on the flesh, it takes a lot less work for your knife. As always, guys, we always want to make sure we wash our vegetables before we eat them, even though some of them will say triple washed, et cetera, et cetera. It's really important that we wash them just to make sure we're not ingesting any extra pesticides or any type of um, germs that may have been picked up from people shopping at the store, from touching, coughing, whatever it may have been. I'm sure you guys will notice as I'm slicing here, I kind of have a claw hand with my uh, less dominant hand. So I'm holding the knife with my right, cutting with my left. I create a claw with my left hand. That way, when I'm actually holding the vegetables, I'm using my knuckles as a guide. So my fingertips are never exposed to be cut. I'm using my knuckle as a guide. So I never have to worry about actually slicing my fingertip or shaving my nail. And I've went ahead and I've already pre-measured out by weight my squash zucchini, so on and so forth. Another fun thing about this recipe for you guys is you can double it, you can triple it, you can cut it in half, you can cut it down to a quarter. So you can make the volume to fit, to fit who you're cooking for, for your family or yourself. And as I'm cutting, I'm slicing, I'm not chopping down. Again, that goes back to the impact on our wrists so we don't develop carpal tunnel in our lifetime. Well, there is no right or wrong way to cut your vegetables. It's whatever is manageable for you when cutting them. There's no split them lengthwise, split them down you know, in half by thickness just making it manageable so you can use your knife effectively. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to just shout them out. I've already preheated my pan oven for the chicken. I'm gonna use a cast iron skillet to get a nice sear without every, actually having to sear it on the stove top.
What can you do to fix your cutting board from slipping around like that? You can always put a little bit of a wet linen underneath it, a wet um, bar rag, those types of things. I like to challenge myself, live life, life dangerously, I guess you would say. of a flavor difference between yellow onions and white onions? There's a mild flavor difference. It's a bit more concerned about the sugar content of the onions. Whites tend to have a little bit more sugar opposed to the yellows. So the yellows will have a little bit of a stronger flavor. The whites are a little bit sweeter, nicer for caramelizing. A little more, I guess it would be a delicate flavor with that with the white onions. that this pan is getting nice and warm. <coughs> Starting to get a little bit of smoke off of my pan that I'm gonna saute the vegetables in. That's a very important step when anytime we saute things, we never wanna put cold vegetables in a cold pan with cold oil. That oil is just going to absorb into any vegetables that we cook. So we want to make sure we have a warm pan, warm oil before we start tossing our vegetables in. So start off with our bell pepper. And I'm going to have to do this in stages just because I don't have the ability to use a 14 or 16 inch saute pan on my stove top. So I have to do it in multiple batches. And that's okay because we want to get a little bit of color on there. We don't want to um, stew it just yet. Same thing, we don't need to agitate our pan a bunch while we're cooking these vegetables over here. Just get them in there, leave that heat on nice and high. We don't disturb them much. That way we get some of that nice color, that caramelization that I was just talking about, bringing out some natural sweetness to go with the bitterness of that pepper. Now, I'm sure you guys noticed there when I was cutting the pepper, I was going with a circular motion of a half moon while I'm slicing it. And then when I get to the 12 o'clock or the top of the pepper onion, I just pop it over here. I just pop it over and continue on. So while that's working, our vegetables are sauteing. We're gonna start our tomato base. You can take the skins off. You don't have to, to take the skins off. It's called concassang. We would blanch the tomatoes in salted boiling water. Start by putting an X on the bottom, drop them in the water, boil them for, simmer them for about one minute. And then the skin would peel off in four petals where we made that X. I prefer not to take my skins off just because of the nutritional value that's in those skins. I don't want to lose it when I'm eating. Now we eat for flavor and nutrition. So whenever you can leave the skins on your carrots, those types of things, it's quite beneficial in order to, to do so. Also when cooking with garlic at home, I'm about to slice that. It's really nice if you can use whole garlic cloves and break them down yourself. You get such a nice flavor from using whole garlic opposed to buying the mints in the jar. 
but you buy the mint in the jar, you almost need to use twice what the, rec the recipe recommends. John, do you notice much difference between organic garlic or like local garlic and just conventional garlic? I've heard that there's like local or organic garlic is like way more garlicky. Yes, but that's um, heavily based on the soil that it's grown, the growing conditions. There's a place out towards Misik Buckley area, an actual garlic farm where they grow some phenomenal garlic. Mm. but they do it in hoop houses and then they transfer to outdoors in the summer. So to, for your question, yes, organic local is the way to go opposed to the mass produced garlic. I have my garlic sliced, I feel some warmth off of my pan. I'm gonna go ahead and get my garlic in there. Now in order, if you guys are comfortable flipping pans, it's nice to choke up near as close to the pan as you can get. Take your product towards uh, away from yourself. And then just a gentle flick of the wrist, or you can just use a spatula if you're comfortable, but it's fun to flip things and saute. And we're not no looking to uh, get any color on our garlic. We're just looking for it to get a little bit aromatic. So that's maybe 30 to one minute in the pan. You actually start to physically smell it. Then you can throw your tomatoes in there. And then always, always fresh ground pepper. It's just like similar to the conversation we were just having about local organic um, garlic being stronger in flavor. So you have to use less. You use fresh ground pepper, you have to use less because the flavor is more prominent. It's almost more floral, a little fruity to it. So I have my garlic, my tomatoes, my parsley, and my basil in this pan. This recipe is not shy on the parsley or the basil, but that gives it that wonderful fresh, fresh flavors that we were just talking about. I'm gonna leave that on medium low heat. Go ahead and put my cover on. And I'm just putting the cover on for about one minute just to help that pan and the vegetables inside the pan get warm. Now I'm gonna pull that pan off just so it doesn't disintegrate into mush. It looks like yes, we have a question. Oh, yeah. Yep, I did use some um, olive oil in that pan before I loaded the garlic tomato into fresh herbs. See, starting to get a little bit of color on my vegetables here. So while this is going on, our vegetables are sauteing for the ratatouille. I'm gonna start boiling, boiling a little bit of water to cook our potatoes, blanch our asparagus as well. I'm gonna start warming up our heavy cream so we can get our truffles, our mixture made and chilled off. Let that cool for about 15 minutes so then we can scoop it. Doing a little multitasking, so please ask questions as we're going through. So 
So there's 250 milliliters of cream. I've already steeped my cherries, dried cherries and some nice red wine. I chose a Bordelais just for the strong flavor pro profile, the fruity notes for me. And now you can heat your wine up in the microwave on the stove top and pour it over your dried cherries to reconstitute them. Or you can put the wine cold, no heat over the cherries and let it sit overnight and you'll get the same thing. I prefer to put cold wine and let it sit overnight for 24 hours. That way the wine pulls out more of the natural sugars in the cherry and we'll get more of a prominent cherry flavor for our truffle mixture. Was that just any kind of red wine? Yes, any red wine, but always remember when we're cooking with wine, we wanna make sure with whatever we're cooking, we would drink. So if you wouldn't drink it, don't cook with it. I know it can be enticing when you see a two to $3 bottle of wine, but if it's not balanced properly, not good flavors, you're definitely not gonna enjoy it. And that's gonna have a effect on your final product of your food. So I got some nice color on my peppers. Go ahead, add a little bit more oil into the pan. Let that get back up to temperature. We're starting to get some moisture release from our tomatoes over here. So I've already pre-measured out, I have three tablespoons of red wine with three tablespoons of cherries. If you make extra, if you make Manhattans at home or any kind of cocktails, this red wine with the cherries because of the amount of sugar and the dried cherries, it makes a really, really nice um, simple syrup, a cherry simple syrup. So you can use it when you're making cocktails at home, margaritas, Manhattans, anything you enjoy. So I'm starting to see a little bit of smoke in my pan. I hope you guys are too with the black backdrop. So we're gonna go ahead and get our onions in this pan next. So I'm gonna go ahead and add one tablespoon of red wine, cherry concentrate, cherry flavor, and uh, no cherries into my cream. So you guys can see red wine, the cream, no cherries just yet. I've had my chocolate out room temperature on top of my stove just so it can start to acclimate. You see it's getting a little melty on the edges. We're not looking for a high heat content on this chocolate, otherwise it won't set properly for our truffles. We're tempering it. So if we're being too high of a heat to this, the the chocolate won't reset and we'll need to seed it. So by just heating it up to 110 degrees with our cream mixture, it's gonna be about the perfect texture to where after we roll them in cocoa powder, nuts, whatever not, you'll be able to bite them with your teeth and then it will melt into your mouth. So as you guys can see, the onions got some color on them nice and quick for us. So we're gonna put those with our peppers. Add a little bit more oil into this pan. We're gonna go in with our zucchini now. You know, this recipe of ratatouille will feed about six people, very hungry people. You can again, cut it down into thirds, halves, quarters, whatever fits your family. 
It was just really important for this cooking class that we got our ratatouille going first. If we read through our recipes before cooking, we know that this takes about 45 minutes start to finish, yeah, about an hour start to finish. So we really wanted to make sure that we could get this going. So it'd be done by the time that our Niswa salad is done, our chicken is done, and our cherries or chocolates are done. Again, we're not salting any of these vegetables just yet. We'll finish seasoning in the ratatouille before we put the lid on it and let it go for about 30 minutes. Again, we're just looking for a quick color on these vegetables. We're not trying to saute them all the way down. If we do that, they're gonna to turn to mush when we go and transform them into our ratatouille pot. So we just wanna get some of that nice color on there. And typically in Paris, France, a lot of people are trying the wines while they're cooking. I can't do that, I'll lose focus or over season. So we'll have a little glass of wine when we cheers at the end of class. We can see our cream is starting to simmer over here. Move our cutting board so we don't melt it. We're gonna bring our chocolate over to our workspace. We're gonna bring this warm cream mixture and wine mixture over. We're gonna pour it right over those chocolate chips. We're gonna let this warm cream melt and uh, red wine melt the chocolate chips for us. I'm gonna go ahead and add my chopped dried cherries into it that have been reconstituted with the red wine. We let that sit for about 30 seconds and then we're gonna start mixing it. And when we mix it, we mix it from the dead center where I place the cherries in with the chocolate. And that's just so it emulsifies or it's homogenous. So the mixture of the chocolate, the cream, the red wine and the cherries will be smooth. There shouldn't be a separation or it won't look broken. Because if it's broken, then we won't be able to scoop them with our melon baller, our tablespoon to get the truffles that we want. Some nice color on our zucchini. Since we're getting close with all of our vegetables are done, I'm going to start loading them into our ratatouille pot over here. Get a little bit more oil in the pan. This is a 10 inch pan. I'm using about a tablespoon of oil. Uh, per load with the vegetables. I'm go ahead and dump my eggplant in there. As you can see, it's a little bit more firm as opposed to spongy. So put that in there. Let that get a little bit of color. I'm gonna go ahead and add in my peppers and onions. Make sure to scrape all that oil and that juice out of the whatever dish I'm holding it in. That's a lot of lovely flavor we don't want to lose behind. Now this has sat for about 30 seconds here. So I'm gonna go ahead and just start mixing right from the center. Small, it can be counterclockwise, clockwise, whatever tickles your fancy, but we're gonna work on emulsifying the chocolate in the center of the bowl first. Can't really hold it at an angle, otherwise I'm gonna start spilling. But you can see that it's starting to look like a nice chocolate sauce in the middle. That means it's becoming homogenous, emulsified. So from this point, we'll start working out towards the outsides of the bowl. Now, if we were to mix this big circles, it would look broken like the outside of the bowl here does, but we have a nice homogenous mixture in the center. Now 
Gonna make sure we scrape and get all the cream on the sides the best that we can. And don't fret those little chunks in there, those cherries again. Now, in order to tell if you did this right, you can see how this has a really nice sheen to it. That means that it's homogenous. It was emulsified properly. So we're gonna have a good run for our truffles when we come to scoop and dust them in a little bit of cocoa butter. That sheen means you did the right temperature and the right mixture. And then always with desserts, even your cheesecakes, your cookies, everything, we always add a little bit of salt to that. And all the salt does is it cuts the sugar, the sugary dish down so it doesn't seem as sweet, but you still get those really nice flavors. So I'm just going to do a tiny little pinch in there. Starting to get some really nice color on the eggplant. So I'm going to go ahead and put that right into our ratatouille pot over here. Last but not least, we have to do our summer squash still. So again, that one to two tablespoons of some nice olive oil. Swirl it around the pan to make sure it's nice and warm before we add our vegetables. It will sizzle if it's right. Got that nice sizzle. I'm gonna finish mixing my chocolate over here. So John, I don't understand how the ratatouille is going to stay firm because you're going to still cook it for a long time, right? For about 30 to 45 minutes, yes, but everything has been cooked really al dente. So there's still a lot of texture to the vegetables that are in this pan right now. We're just trying to get the color on them, but it still has a lot of texture to it. Like I can squeeze it and it doesn't turn to mush. So we're making sure when we're getting the color on our vegetables, that we're leaving them al dente, which is you know almost all the way cooked. So the zucchini here, which is slippery little bugger, still has some really nice texture. Like I'm applying good pressure on that and I can't smush it with my fingers. Okay. So when we're getting color on our pan over here, I'm at about medium, a little over medium heat. So you can really hear that sizzle and that uh, steam coming off the pan. We just wanna make sure that we don't cook these vegetables through and through. We're looking for them to only be about 60% of the way cooked before going into this pan. And then the tomatoes don't have a lot of moisture, so it's not gonna actually stew when we go to finish off. And then before chocolate starts to settle too much, we have a nice pan ready right here. And I'm just gonna put this mixture into the pan. Uh, we're gonna stick it in the refrigerator for about 10 to 15 minutes, just so it starts to set up so we can scoop it out with our melon baller or portion scoop. You can use a tablespoon, you can use a piping bag. I'm gonna use a rubber spatula just to make sure I don't leave any chocolate behind. Well, chocolate's one of those things, just like coffees, teas, we want to make sure that we're getting it from a sustainable source where the people that are processing and picking are being paid a fair wage. That's very, very important. So I got my chocolate in the pan here. Go ahead and put it into an even layer. Put it in a nice even layer and I'm going to stick right in the refrigerator. I'm 
I've already preheated my oven to 400 degrees. And I have a cast iron skillet in the oven for the chicken. For the purpose of the class, I've already cleaned the chicken just so I didn't have to worry about cross-contamination with all this ready-to-eat product, the truffle, the ratatouille. I've seasoned the um, outer sides of the breast. We call those a presentation side in the kitchen. We go ahead and season the underside that connects to the breastplate. A little bit of fresh ground pepper. Pull our cast iron out. Nice tablespoon of olive oil. We're gonna do what we call presentation side down. And that's just this surface because that will be presented on the plate with the salad and the ratatouille. And I'm gonna process this down in the oven where you guys can't see just because of the spatter is gonna pretty much go all, all over the place up top. And I don't wanna give myself salmonella or my partner. Excuse me, guys, I do have to wash my hands real fast. Come a little bit closer to the action now. So we got some really nice color on our summer squash. Cooked al dente, it's not starting to break down. So I'm gonna go right into the pan. Turn this heat down to nice and low. Not burn her off. This is also why we're not adding um, any salt to this mixture just yet for your question, Luis, because if we added salt to this, it would want to start pulling moisture out of this. So we're going to salt at the very, very end. It's another important reason that we get that nice caramelization on all those vegetables before we add them in here, because we're not going to add any tomato paste, any sugar. We're going to use the natural sweetness from each of these vegetables kind of to come together as a harmony for a nice ratatouille. So from that point, I got all our vegetables in. I have my pre-measured out some nice white wine, semi-dry. Semi-dry is nice just because it kind of makes feels like almost you have cotton balls on the outside of your tongue when you're drinking it. So it makes your palate really, you know, get a little lip smacker or tongue smacker. And that will help you taste all these wonderful individual flavors in the ratatouille itself. So our white wine is in. Throw the lid on that bad boy. Keep that heat on a medium low. Then we'll move on to our next project. So from here, we're gonna start working on our Niçoise salad. I'm starting to boil my water right now. I haven't added any salt to it yet. I prefer to use kosher salt when I cook. I like the fine sea salt, but I like the large granular of kosher. And that's just because I've been using it for so long in kitchens, I developed a muscle memory to a pinch. So if I grab a pinch of kosher salt, opposed to a pinch of fine sea salt. I use much more fine sea salt than I would kosher. So for me personally, I tend to over season if I use fine sea salt. So my potato water is almost ready. Give all my nice vegetables. Potatoes, asparagus, 
cherry tomatoes, Kalmala olives. Do you guys have any questions so far? What kind of wine would you serve with this meal? A very good question. I personally would probably go a white wine, a semi-dry. You, if you like sweeter wines, um, a late harvest Riesling would go really, really well, just with the delicate flavors. But you could even have fun with it and go with a Bordeaux or a Cab Franc. You know, the really fun thing about cooking with wine or cooking and eating with wine, there's two different ways to go about it. You can either go to where the wine and the food really mesh together, and they blend, they accent each other, they're not overpowering, or you can go with strong flavors like ratatouille and a strong border, uh, Bordelais, Cab Franc, to where they butt heads. So they're fighting for the flavors in your mouth, kind of makes an explosion of, of different flavors while you're taking different bites. You know, for example, take a bite of ratatouille, take a sip of a Cab Franc, then take a sip of Cab Franc, and while you still have a little bit of wine in your mouth, take a bite of ratatouille <laughs> and see how the flavors taste differently. Food and wine, you know, there's no right or wrong way to go about it. People always say, oh, you can't do fish with a red wine. Well, there's Pinot Noir. It has a really subtle fruity flavors. It tends to work really well with delicate fish, even though it's a red wine. Did you salt the uh, product first before you chopped that eggplant or after? Um, after I chopped it. Thank you. Yep, I uh, chopped it, I put it in a bowl and then I used, I believe it was a teaspoon and a quarter, a teaspoon of half of salt, sprinkle it over and then tossed it in the pan just to ensure even coverage. So we're gonna Come over and check our chicken down low. So we're starting to get some little bit of color on our chicken. So I flipped them over in the cast iron skillet. Put on a little bit of rosemary on those chicken breasts. And then I'm going to take my sauce, which was just a little bit of orange marmalade. If you can try to find a Florida based orange marmalade. And I only say that because orange marmalade, obviously oranges come down from Florida, but theirs typically has more of a honey flavor to it. So you get like the sleeping bear dunes thistle style honey. It has those flavor notes in it. So it's not sugar sweet, it's naturally honey sweet. So it's not really overpowering. And I'm gonna start by pouring just a little bit onto my chicken breast. And go right into the back into the oven with these. And then I have my dirty chicken tongs and always food safety. We wanna make sure we keep this separated from everything else just because the salmonella is such a dirty bird. Bring you guys back over. So our water is just about to temperature. While that's working, I'm gonna get ready to Vitamix up our vinaigrette. You can use a food processor, a Vitamix, an immersion blender, whatever you really like for this sauce. Because of the mustard content as the emulsifier, you don't need to stream in the olive oil like a vinaigrette. It's kind of a one food processor style um, dressing. So I use some nice whole grain mustard, extra virgin olive oil, a few cloves of garlic, some nice red wine, uh, red wine vinegar. And then I'm going to add the anchovies. The anchovies, if you're not a big fan of fish flavors, 
you can omit this, but because we're not serving this with fish like you traditionally would, I'm really gonna make sure I use the anchovy fillets in this just to incorporate that flavor. I like anchovy paste because then you can keep it in the fridge and you can just use a little bit of it. Very, very true. Nice and convenient. Yeah, I didn't think about this. My cat is going absolutely crazy right now at the sound of that anchovy can. So we're gonna put our potatoes into that water. We're gonna let those cook for six to 10 minutes here. Show you guys, we got our mixer or full of all those nice ingredients for our vinaigrette. Some fresh ground pepper. Going to use a little bit of Merlot infused salt opposed to regular kosher salt for this. I apologize for the noise, guys. It's going to get loud for a quick second here. As you guys can see, it's nice and emul a nice emulsified sauce. But we always have to make sure that we taste everything as we're cooking, just to make sure that that seasoning is proper. Oh, that's delightful. So our potatoes are just very straightforward. We're boiling them in some salty water, salty like the uh, Baltic Sea. You wanna make sure that the salt is a really strong prominent flavor when we cook the potatoes, just because they have such a high starch content. We really wanna make sure that they're seasoned properly. Go ahead and check on our ratatouille. As you guys can see, there is steam coming off. Everything is still intact as far as uh, textures, different shapes, different colors. It's beautiful as it is delicious. Now, if you're a vegetarian, you can saute mushrooms and throw mushrooms in here for a little extra added protein if you like. You could also do tempeh, tofu, those types of things. I'm going to go ahead and pull our chocolate out just to make sure that it doesn't get too cold so we can still scoop it and ball it. We're starting to get very close. Still has that sheen that we were talking about earlier in the class. The top is starting to get set. The bottom needs maybe five or 10 more minutes. Potatoes are getting very close. So I'm gonna get ready to blanch my asparagus in the same pot. Then the potatoes were rinsed before I started. The asparagus has been washed as well. I have a nice bowl of ice cold water over here. Go ahead and drop my asparagus into that pot. That's gonna take maybe one to two minutes to cook. We still want texture on that. So we want it to have a bite. The al dente about 80 to 90% of the way done. ice cubes in my water. And the reason we're doing that is that ice bath shocks or stops the cooking process of the asparagus. Got my tongs at the ready. I'm gonna go ahead and take a peek at our chicken. 
You know, there is no shame in using thermometers for checking your proteins, fish, chicken, steak. It's about cooking it properly and maximizing the product or the quality of the product so you enjoy it. Again, there is no, nothing wrong with using thermometers to make sure that it's cooked to how you like it. But when we're cooking things, we always wanna keep in mind when we pull it out of the oven, it's gonna to continue to cook and that's called carryover cooking. So anything without a bone in it is gonna carry over cook only 10 degrees. And then say chicken with a bone, um, lamb chops, those are gonna carry over cook about 15 degrees. So if you wanted a nice medium rare lamb chop, you would pull that out about 110 to 105, 115 degrees. That way it carries over to 125, 130 when it's fully rested. Same goes for your chicken breast. We cook chicken to 160 degrees. So we pull it out at 150, 152 degrees, and it will rest right up to 160 degrees, which is the safe eating temperature for chicken. And then for the hard boiled eggs, I didn't wanna make you guys watch me peel a hard boiled egg or a few hard boiled eggs. So I've already cooked a few of them and peeled them. I just cooked them for a hard boiled over hard. I put them in the water, ice cold water, egg shells in, bring it up to a boil on medium high heat, kill the heat immediately, put the lid on and um, let it sit in that warm water for about 10 to 12 minutes, pull them out of that pot and do the same thing with the ice bath like we did with our asparagus to stop the cooking process. If I want a, um, over easy, a soft poached egg, I'd only leave them in that water for about six minutes, same process, cold water, eggs in the water, bring it up to a boil, kill the heat. When the lid goes on, I start my timer six minutes. When it's done at six minutes, immediately drain them and into an ice bath to shock them. Go ahead and check our potatoes. About two minutes out on our potatoes. So we're gonna get down and check our chicken. Hopefully don't set off the smoke alarms. I have hypersensitive smoke alarms at my house. Steam from Brussels sprouts will set them off. So we're at about 149 degrees. I'm gonna poke it somewhere else just to make sure we don't wanna because as you saw, I did that a little bit of drip of juice came out. That one's poking at 154. This one was at 147 to the other breast. This one's registering 146, 146. So we're gonna pop it back in there just to make sure it's a safe temperature before we eat this. I'd say about three to four more minutes with this chicken. To finish it off, a little bit more of our marmalade sauce. Right back in. So from this point, I'm gonna get ready to start building a plate and hoping our trough chocolate will be set here in a moment. Oh yeah, we're very close on our chocolate. Do some nice salad greens. I wonder if you guys are timid about uh, using the fillets, anchovy fillets with this dressing. Keep in mind that 95% of Caesar dressings are made with anchovies as well. It just adds a really uh, nice umami flavor to things. So it really balances it out. I always like my dressing on the side. You can toss that, toss your dressing with the greens, but I like to do a nice little smear of the dressing on the side of the plate so I can control how, my, how much I'm eating as I'm eating it. Move my greens over. Yeah. 
pull out our asparagus and drain it on a clean rag. Some nice cherry tomatoes. Some Kalamala olives. Pull out our hot potatoes, being very careful while doing so. Yes, those potatoes are warm, but that's what makes this salad so much fun is the warm potatoes. You get a little bit of hot, you get a little bit of cold with every bite. Let's take one more peek at our ratatouille. So we're gonna go ahead now and check the seasoning on this. Uh, we don't forget about our chicken in the oven because it's probably ready to come out. Very nice. Have our salt container. Some more fresh ground black pepper. Off on that. Can't forget about our boiled egg on that salad. Egg on there. Get some of our ratatouille out. Make sure our burners are off. We'll go ahead and pull our chicken out. Go ahead and just double check that temperature that it's 155 degrees. Beautiful. We're gonna let that rest for five minutes, just so the juices that it has expelled are gonna re um, absorb into the chicken breast. We'll slice it. We're gonna pour a little bit of more, more of that uh, nice chicken marinade on top, put it on our salad plate. But we're, while we're waiting for that, we're gonna go ahead and make some of our truffles really quick. So I have some nice unsweetened cocoa powder, that truffle base that we made. we we'll give it a poke here just so you guys can see what I'm talking about. It's firm, but it's slightly soft. My, I can do uh, dimples with my fingertips into it. Get the camera a little bit better for you guys. Again, if you like big truffles, you could use a tablespoon. You can use a melon baller. They also make portion scoops, but at a much smaller size. <laughs> so I'm gonna use a melon baller. Let's get a nice little scoop going. Pull it out of the ball.
Swirl it around with that cocoa powder. We'll do two more just because everything's in threes is always better. Something aesthetically pleasing that chefs like to do is in threes. That's why you'll rarely see deuces or fours. It's always in threes. Dropping into our chocolate. Now when making these truffles, you don't have to use red wine. You don't have to use dried cherries. You can use white wine and apricots. Uh, dried strawberries, any kind of dried fruit without sugar added. The key thing in there is using dried fruit that doesn't have any extra sugar added to it. A little sprinkle for garnish. All right, let's go ahead and pull one of those chicken breasts. This is called at a compound bias when it's at a 45 degree angle. Spread it out a little bit. The only reason we're doing that is because we're gonna come hit it with a little bit of our sauce still. Our vinegar, our orange marmalade, fresh rosemary, some nice vinegar. I'm not gonna use this whole chicken breast because that's about 10 ounces of meat. It's, this is from Oriana, it's, um, where is it from, gosh. It's a really nice local chicken. Nature's just, Acres. Nature's Acres, yes. But you can see how much extra juice on top of what I poured came out of that chicken. Just a beautiful, well-fed, well-treated animal. I'll bring it over here. And that is a taste of spring, guys, in Paris. <laughs> Oh my God, that looks so good. And wow. then of course, if we're in Paris, wow. Wow. you need to have a little bit of wine. Yep. Well, cheers guys, that was a lot of fun. I know it was a lot to cover in a short period of time, but if you have any further questions, don't be uh, shy to reach out. I'm always happy to talk about food in any capacity. Oh, thank you, John. That was excellent and I appreciate it. Just your techniques, you're so good to uh, write down and, and that, so salute. It was my, it was my absolute pleasure. It was a, a lot of fun, guys. Again, I know it was a lot in one little meal, but cheers to everybody. Yeah. Yep. Great. I hope you have a wonderful spring cheers. and enjoy all the yeah. Good. I want to try that ratatouille because I've never had it. That's It's always been, like you to say, like kind of mushy. I mean... It's tasty, but it's 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 more like a sauce, not like the way you made it. It doesn't have that textural appeal. Are you going to be at Oriana tomorrow? Uh, I am not. Okay, I was going to say I'll drop some off if you were, uh, but <laughs> you can, you can <laughs> Libby will be though. Libby will be. Yeah. That would be awesome. <laughs> I'll, I'll bring a little to go, and I'll I'll drop it off for everybody. Good. Wow, That's thank good. you. What a treat. Yeah, I, I'm sure impressed with how you pulled it all off you know <clears throat> I was like hmm I don't know if he's going to be able to finish but <laughs> of it course. was the as seen on tv having certain things ready beforehand yeah yeah, yeah. felt yeah. like top chef energy <laughs> in the room <laughs> yeah a little mini some glass goes a long way just having yeah. things in order yeah, yeah. it looked really good John oh so good wow. yum <clears throat> thank you so much I really appreciate all your tips too you know about oh yeah um, cutting things and for one minute please well of course one minute. So the things you learn along the way in the industry so it's nice to pass those on for people that are passionate about cooking as well yeah very helpful yeah well 
you are going to have a wonderful meal tonight, John, and Matatui to last you a week. <laughs> yes, yep. Yeah. Uh, I might watch Matatui and have some Matatui tonight. Oh, uh, Vicki is coming in behind me right now, and I think she's going to be in Oriana too, John. <laughs> I'll bring, Thanks I have a, so a little much, bit of John. extra, so I'll bring some extra ones in. Not a problem, guys. Yeah. Gotta go. Thank, Thank you. you. You're very welcome. Have a good night, everybody. Yep. Yep. Take care. care. Bye. We'll, we'll see you later. Bye. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.